God bless you, cuz. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise his name. Wonderful Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Pray you're doing well this evening. Having a little issue here with this uh, streaming, saying the bandwidth is too low. I'm trying to figure out how to change that. I don't know. I have to fool with it later. So I'll figure it out later. Hopefully it'll work tonight. Thank you, Lord God. But well, amen, amen. I, I thank you for tuning in this evening. Um, no one's joined in yet but yourself. That's all I see so far. But we're going to go ahead and get started anyway with tonight's uh, lesson. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, well, praise the Lord. I don't know why the screen keep popping up on here, but we're going to try to bypass this anyhow and trust God. Things are going to work out according to his will. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Gracious God, our Father, I thank you for this blessed day you have created. Thank you for your loving kindness better than life itself. God, you are great, sovereign, and holy. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to share your word tonight, oh God. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, to bring change in our lives, that we become more and more enriched in your spirit, oh God, to live a fruitful and a free life in the kingdom of God. We bind every demonic force, every attack and assault that's coming against this word, oh God. Even a live stream that will function accordingly, Father God, without any hindrances or delays. We thank you, oh God, for our free access in the airways, that the word will go forth, oh God, with power and authority to set the captives free. We give you glory, give you honor, give you praise, and we thank you that you lead us in victory every day as your word declares. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquered through him that love us, and we give you praise, O oh God, because the love of God abides in our heart that we're able to be outward expression of your love to many others. As that you tonight be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. All right, all right. Tonight we're going to talk about um, uh, spiritual vagabond, spiritual vagabond in our lesson tonight. And it says, how spiritual va va vagabonds are born, how spiritual vagabonds are born, we're going to talk about tonight. Amen. So we're going to trust God that things are going to go according to his will in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. This thing is irritating me. I don't know what's going on. I never had this issue before. This is a new issue. That's the thing about Facebook. You never know what encounter you're going to have that brings uh, distractions or try to even disrupt what you're doing for the kingdom of God. But nevertheless, God is still in control. 
And we're just going to trust God that it's going to get across the way he wants to go in the name of Jesus. So again, I thank you for tuning in tonight. And I pray that those who hear this word even afterward will help be enriched in their spirit to bring a change in their lives and their minds in the name of Jesus. God is awesome. He's sovereign. He's holy. God bless you, my sister. God bless you. Thank you for joining. Hallelujah. Tonight, we want to talk about um, how spiritual vagabonds are born, how spiritual vagabonds are born. First, we must define what a vagabond is. A vagabond is an individual who's wandering, moving from place to place without any set settling or habitation. They don't have a home or no job. They're just wanderers. They're floating around without a certain destination. They don't know where they're going. Whatever, whatever happens in life is what they're going to accept. And that's not the will of God. A vagabond is a person who wanders from one town to another and another place to another place, having no certain dwelling or abiding in it. And that's what we find in today's time where people don't want responsibility. They doesn't want to find themselves settling any place, even when it comes to church. You got a lot of church hoppers. They, they just can't settle the spiritual vagabonds and they travel from one church to the next church because I don't like the way they sing at this church. I don't like the way the, the people are, are in this church. So I go to another church trying to find acceptance in a different place because I have a wandering spirit. And we rebuke that spirit in the name of Jesus because that's not of God. And that's one thing about it. When God has a destination, a purpose and a plan for you to establish in your life, the devil himself cannot stop you from fulfilling the call on your life that God has set in motion for you to fulfill. You have to have a desire on the inside, got to have a passion, a hunger and a thirst for the things of God and allow the Holy Spirit to flood your heart with his desire and his passion, his will for your life in order to be productive in the kingdom of God. Amen. It's something I was reading um, in Got Questions, the website called gotquestions.org, gotquestions.org. And if you're looking for any answers uh, concerning any scripture in the Bible, you can always refer to this website, gotquestions.org, because there's a lot of commentaries that are on there that defines and breaks down the meaning of different scriptures to us. Not only that gives us insight into the mysteries of the gospel. And it says... Is that a vagabond is a wanderer, often a fugitive or an exile who has no fixed place of dwelling. The first use of the word vagabond in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 4, verse, 3, verse 12. Genesis chapter 4, verse 12. It says, when you work the grounds, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And that's talking about Cain when Cain killed his brother. God told me he's going to be a wanderer. And it says, um, when God pronounced a curse upon Cain for the murder of his brother Abel, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. In the NIV translation, it says the word vagabond is a restless wanderer. A restless wanderer. So the individual can never find any peace. They can't find themselves at rest in any place, so they're always moving about, can't be still. Just like people that got the AHDH, what the AHDA, or whatever that disease is, it's a mental disorder where you can't settle. You always fidgetive, got to keep doing something. You can't find no peace in your heart to just sit out and be still. ADHD, that's what it is, ADHD. And they just continue to just keep doing things because there's no peace in their heart. Cain was banished from society of mankind and was sentenced to lead a nomadic life, a wandering life, a vagabond life. God punished Cain with homelessness, insecurity, uncertainty, and restlessness. Because Cain was jealous of his brother, he killed his brother. And because he killed his brother, God cursed him. And you know what? A lot of people in today's time are living under that same spirit of a vagabond. They're always uncertain about what they're making decisions to do. They're restless. They're homeless. They're insecure. That's why you find in relationships a lot of insecure people because I can't trust you because I can't trust myself. 
So they find themselves drifting into the things of the world. And God is saying it's time to get to the place in yourself where you settle in the things of God and allow the spirit of God to lead God and direct you in a place of peace. We can never find our own security until we find our rest in the presence of God. When I find my rest in the presence of God, I can find security. Amen. Vagabonds is usually used in a negative sense in the Bible. In Psalms 109, verse 10, Psalms 109, verse 10, so let his children continually be vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also from their de desolate places. So because of the spirit of a vagabond that settles in the hearts of those who refuse to submit to God, God said, you're going to continue to wander and beg. You got a lot of beggars who choose to beg for a living because they don't want responsibilities. So I'd rather get out here, stand on the street corners. I'd rather get out here, stand in front of stores and try to convince people to give to me so I don't have to work. You got people don't want to work. You got people don't want to do anything to make their life better. They're comfortable being a pauper, a beggar. And God is saying tonight in the body of Christ, this should not be. We need to come to the place in ourselves where we recognize the spirit of God and allow the spirit of God to cleanse our minds and our hearts from that wandering spirit. The word says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And that is the truth. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. They find themselves constantly in a state of restlessness. When you don't rely on the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom, to give you insight, to make sound decisions, you're going to always follow the leadership and the dictates of the flesh, that mental mentality of the world. Because the world feels that I can do anything I choose to do with the absence of God. And that's a sad place to be where you feel like you don't need God in your life. And because of this, Vagabonds are often seen as beggars who contribute nothing and live on the mercy of societies. That's sad. Live on the mercy of society. So I, I need you to help me. I need you to give me some money. I need you to give me some food. I need you to do this. Give me some clothes. I, I, I've been homeless. Some people don't have a choice from being homeless because it's things that have uh, shifted in their lives that caused them to get into a vulnerable state where they lost everything. Some been burned out of their homes, which caused them to be homeless. But those of you who know within yourself that this is something you chose to do, I remember over 20 years ago, I was attending a men's fellowship, and there was this one brother there who said he had a real good job, he had a family, but he chose to live a pauper life. He chose to leave his family, to leave his job, and live under a bridge. And he said that was his choice because he got sick and tired of living for other people. So he figured the best life to live is a beggar life. And that's a poor mentality. When your mind tells you that you know better than a beggar, you know better than a pauper, you're never going to have anything in life, you're never going to be successful, you're never going to prosper, that's a lie from the devil. And God is saying tonight, he's breaking that spirit off of his children when you get a revelation and understanding of the word of God for you. Then it goes and it says, the vagabond lifestyle was associated with irresponsibility and disreputable behavior. Disreputable relate behavior. So no repentance. I'm not going to change my mind the way I feel about the way I'm living. I accept this. this is who I am. This is what I want to be. And, and nothing's going to change this. So then they're not they're not careful, care, not even caring about their appearance. And that's what it's talking about. Disreputable is you don't even care about how you look. You got some beggars that drive Mercedes Benz. You got some beggars that drive Cadillacs. And they stand on the corner. I've seen this in Texas where this family was confessed to be homeless. 
but they had a Mercedes Benz down the road parked around the corner. And later on that day, we seen them going to get in that car and drive away. Some people do this as a scam because they want to see how much they can get from other people. And we have to really be aware when God tells you to give to certain individuals or don't give to certain people. You know in your heart if it's the leadership of the Holy Spirit to help somebody who's poor. You know it because the Holy Spirit will confirm in your heart. If it's not of God, something's not going to register in your spirit because you know that your antenna will go and say, hey, this is a scam. This person is trying to just uh, uh, manipulate people to get what they want. In the context of Proverbs chapter 6, verse 11, it says, And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man, a pauper, a beggar, somebody who won't, don't want responsibility. It says, There's a warning to foolish and lazy people. The New American Standard Version translates this verse in this way. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. While poverty is not a sin, the reason for poverty may be when the person foolishly chooses to live as a vagabond because he or she is lazy or irresponsible. So people who are irresponsible don't want to do for themselves. I need you to take care of me. I need to live in your house. Don't pay you no rent. I just need you to provide everything I need. My, my, my necessities of life, my, my personal hygiene stuff, you need to take care of me. I don't, need, I don't need to get no job. I don't need to earn no money. I just need you to take care of me. That's irresponsible. And the label of a vagabond is a rebuke. God rebukes you for that spirit of a vagabond, vagabond. In Acts chapter 19, verse 13, we read of a vagabond Jewish exorcist who traveled from city to city, casting out demons for money. Remember the story of the seven sons of Sceva? In Acts chapter 19, you get a chance, read Acts, Acts chapter 19. And you'll find out there were certain sorcerers who were vagabonds, and they were casting out demons for money. And people would fall into the trap and give them money. But until they came up against the true God, it says for, for most newer translations describe these men as in, 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 intenderate. But the King James Version used, them, used the term vagabonds. The seven sons of Sceva, infamous for trying to cast out demons in the name of Jesus that Paul preached about had no idea what they were inviting upon themselves. Verse 15 and 16 is reference scripture to that. It says, records, it said the records of the demons answered, Jesus, I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? The demons through the possessed man attacked the vagabond exorcist and beat them up and left them naked and wounded. So Acts chapter 19, verse 15 and 16. Because they were fake, they were schemers, they came across the true God that stopped them in their tracks from their scheming. And they tried to cast out a demon in the name of who Paul cast out demons from, which was the name of Jesus, the name of every name. And the demons, hallelujah, they recognized the true God. And they knew that these men were not of the true God. And that's why the enemy came upon them, beat them and stripped them naked because they were trying to do something they didn't have the right or authorization to do. So you got to be careful. This is a key point. When you call yourself casting out demons out of people's lives and the Lord did not tell you to do that, you haven't been prayed up, you haven't been consecrated, you're not walking in the anointing. You need to be careful because demonic forces are transferable. They will come from the individual and jump on you. And before you know it, you're losing your mind. About to take your life because you gave into the spirit of the enemy. 
And God is saying tonight, pay attention. Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith of Jesus Christ. Don't allow yourself to fall under the category of a vagabond. The life of a vagabond is devoid of responsibility for ministry. That's deep. A vagabond, the life of a vagabond is devoid of the responsibility of ministry because they have no power. They don't have no submission. They don't have no authority. A, and good stewardship of the resource that God entrusts to each of us, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, so we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. First Peter chapter 4, verse 9 and 10 says, Show hospitality to each one another without grumbling. As each man received the gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of, of God's very grace, of God's many-sided grace. God's grace has many sides. God's grace can reach anybody in any condition. So we have been entrusted as a true child of God who desires to walk in ministry with the power of the anointing. And the anointing have been entrusted upon you that you can operate in kingdom authority. There have been times when God's people were forced to live as vagabonds through no fault of their own. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 36 and 38. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 36 and 38. Other, others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn into two, they were killed with a sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Because of no fault of their own, people were ostracized, they were, they were cast out, they were rejected. They were beaten. They were scandalized because the enemy had a plan to kill your life. And there are many people today who are going through the same thing, flogging and mocking by people's mouths because people are hating on you because of what God calls you to do. That's a whole other message. We leave it for another time. When persecution broke out after Jesus' resurrection, Christians were scattered. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on the day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. So after Christ rose from the dead, Paul was assigned to be put to death. People scattered. Only ones that didn't scatter was the apostles who stood under the power of the Holy Ghost, under anointing, to do what God called them to do to preach the gospel. Over the next 300 years, history tells us that Christians were driven from their homes, their property seized, and some had even lived in caves to survive. Living as vagabonds, because of their laziness is nothing to be proud of. Living as a vagabond because you're lazy is nothing to boast about. But being forced into vagabond life for Jesus' sake is a form of persecution. And that will be rewarded in eternity. You'll get your reward because you were driven to vagabond life because of something you've done for, for God or for the life of Jesus Christ. So you got to recognize that that spirit is a strong spirit. And that spirit would drive you to a place where you don't want to be sometime. But you still have to stand in the faith and trust God to deliver you. It is for righteous, for God to avenge his servants. It is for the righteous, for God to avenge his servants. It is the... It is unrighteous for God to avenge service of themselves. So you can't fight your own battle. God will fight for you. God will deliver you. God will defeat your adversaries for you. He'll destroy your enemies before you. 
when you put the trust in him to take care of your enemy. Mr. Bavardier, or Mr. Bevere, I just read your book, The Bait of Satan Today. I could not put it down. This is certainly one of the best books I ever read. This is by a, a, a man from Pennsylvania, I mean a man named P.A. from Missouri. How spiritual vagabonds are born. The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. The Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him, seeing that he is anointed of the Lord. So David retained his servants with his words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And this is what we talked about last week, how David hid in the cave and eventually Saul came in there to lodge in the same cave where he was hiding. And David had the opportunity to take vengeance against Saul who was trying to kill him, but he didn't. He did not take revenge in his own hands. He trusted God to deal with an enemy because he loved Saul as a father and fought Saul rejected him. He was hurt because of Saul, but he would not allow anybody to hurt Saul, not even himself. In the last chapter, we saw David was mistreated by the man he hoped would be his father. David kept trying to understand where he had gone wrong, what he had done to turn Saul's heart against him, and how he could he win it back. He proved his loyalty by sparing Saul's life, even though Saul aggressively pursued his life. Isn't that something? When people you trusted in, you confide in, you love, and they were for you for a season, and all of a sudden they turn on you, and your heart, you want to take revenge, but the Holy Spirit says, no, vengeance mine says the Lord, I'll repay. So you got to just leave it in the hands of God and pray for them. That despite who use you, say I'm or evil against you falsely for his name's sake. So David was in this type of predic predicament where he had to rest in the finished work of God, allow God to deal with the adversary. He cried out to Saul with his head bound to the ground, saying, See that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hands. I have not sinned against you. Once David knew he had shown his loyalty to his leader, in his mind, his in to his leader, his mind was at ease. Later he learned more devastating news. Saul still desired to destroy him. David refused to raise his hand against the one who he sought to take his life. Though God had put an army to sleep and had given him a, a companion to lead for permission to kill Saul. So David could have killed Saul. He had a lot of people with him to kill Saul, but he would not lift his hand against him. David somehow sensed that this was sleeping army served another pursuit. I mean, serving another purpose. So David, let me read this again. David somehow sensed that the sleeping army served another purpose. The testing of this very great heart. Verse, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. He said, Beloved, I do not avenge, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place for wrath to, uh, to wrath. For it is written, vengeance mine, I repay, says the Lord. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. It is righteous for God to avenge his servant. It is unrighteous for God's servant to avenge himself. Saul was a man who avenged himself. He chased David, a man of honor, for 14 years and murdered the priests and their families. Ain't this something? 14 years after God told Saul he was losing his position as king. He sought to kill David for 14 years and killed innocent people because he was angry. As David stood over sleeping Saul, he faced important tests. It would, it would reveal whether David still had a noble heart of a shepherd or the insecurity of another Saul. Would he remain a man of God's heart? Initially, it is so much easier when we take matters into our own hands rather than waiting on, on the righteous of God. And that's a true statement. It is so easy to take matters in our own hands to deal with it than to trust God to take care of the adversary. God tests his servants with obedience. He deliberately placed us in situations where the standards of religion and society will appear to justify our actions. He allows others to specifically uh, 
uh, he allowed others to express, especially those close to us, to encourage us to protect ourselves. How many times have you been around people when things happened that was that was out of the norm, and you became angry at the individuals, and other people said, "Oh, you ought, you ought to get even with them. You ought, you ought to go and, and take this matter in your hand and deal with yourself, and just pray for them later." But the Holy Spirit inside of you brings conviction. So when you know you're about to do something to revenge yourself of an individual who hurt you, might be a spouse, might be a broken relationship, might be wayward children, might be a friend, might be a church member, might be a pastor, and you want to take revenge in your hand. You want to speak what's on your mind. And the Holy Spirit said, nope, don't do that. Vengeance is mine. I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. I got this. All you got to do is just leave it in my hands and I'll deal with it. But because of the pride in our hearts, our hearts said, nope, I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to deal with this myself. I'm going to take vengeance in my own hands. Because I have the power to do this and I'm going to do it. And then when you do it, you don't feel no better. You feel worse than you did before. You re retaliated and took revenge in your hands. So we have to be aware of the Holy Spirit and be the designing of the Spirit of God and not allow the enemy to deceive you or manipulate you doing something that's out of the will of God to hurt somebody else. We may even think we will be noble and protect others by avenging ourselves. But this is not God's way. It is the way of the world's wisdom. It is earthly and fleshly. When I considered the opportunity I had for exposing the leader over me, I remember wrestling in with me the thought that he might hurt others if, if he was not exposed, right? So we're talking about a, a man of God who knew about another man of God who was doing things wrong in the church. And he felt in himself, I need to expose him so he can stop hurting other people. And that's the carnal mind. The carnal mind tells you, if I know you have a sin in your life, instead of coming to you, I'm going to go to everybody else to bring it out in the forefront to make them talk about you, to slander you behind your back and make you feel bad. And the Holy Spirit says, vengeance is mine. Don't worry about it. I'm going to expose them my own time. God told Israel, read Isaiah chapter 59, the whole chapter. Isaiah chapter 59. God told the children of Israel, He said, because of your wickedness, so I'm going to expose your pretended righteousness. I'm going to expose you and make you naked before other people because of the sin of your life. If you don't repent. And that's the thing about God. God sees when leaders are wrong. He sees when the congregation is wrong. But one thing about God, He has a way that you can't go around, you can't go over, you can't come under, you must come before him at the door. And God has a way of exposing people in his own timing to bring them to repentance. It's not to shame them or hurt them. But we do things to hurt somebody because I've been hurt. And God is saying tonight, don't allow yourself to listen to the voice of the enemy through your ear gates. But allow the Spirit of God to speak the words of wisdom and knowledge and truth in your ears to make the righteous decisions. I kept thinking, I'm only reporting truth. If I don't, how will this ever end? I was encouraged by others to expose him. Today, however, I know that God gave me this information for one reason, to test me. Was I going to become like the man who sought to destroy me? Or would I allow for God's judgment or mercy if the man if if the man repents? And and that's what God's looking for. A heart that repents. So even though I know a person is wrong, I'm not gonna come to them in my own way of dealing with them according to how I feel my emotions is taking over, but I'm allowing them to stay in the hand of God where God would draw them to repentance. Says, Godly sorrow draws men to repentance. So if their hearts become sorry for what they're really doing, hurting other people in the body of Christ, then conviction will fill their heart 
where they would turn their hearts over to the Lord and say, God, I'm sorry for what I've done. Forgive me. And the Spirit of God, if they need to go before the church, would drive them to come before the church themselves and repent to the church. You don't have to expose people in your own way of doing things to make them act right. I remember my pastor said one Sunday, a lot of people need to get the spirit to act right. Because a lot of times we're not acting right, but we want somebody else to act right in our, in our presence. How can you be filthy, call somebody else filthy, when you're just as bad as they are? And the Holy Spirit says tonight, don't allow yourself to get in yourself to feel like I need to take judgment in my own matters. Because God has a way of dealing with their hearts and your heart if your heart is out of order. So a spiritual vagabond is an individual who sits in the house of God and don't care about how they hurt other people. So I'm going to say what's on my mind. I'm going to say how I feel because I don't care if, if you get hurt. So we have to be careful as a leader as a child of God, on how I respond to other people. I heard um, Ron Carpenter say on Sunday, he said, a lot of people, they receive people the way they perceive them. Hear what I said? They, they receive people according to the way I perceive people. So if I receive you as an individual who's messy, an individual who's messed up, an individual who's filthy, an individual who, who never seemed to be doing things right, and that's all I see about you, I'm going to receive you in that order. But if I receive you the way the Holy Spirit tells me to receive you, I'm going to see Christ in your life. Even though things are going wrong in your life, I'm going to be a brother or sister who have enough faith in myself to come tell you, my brother, my sister, hey, that, hey, you, this is what God says. You need to stop doing what you're doing. God loves you. He cares about you. And, and he wants the best for you. So I, I'm just, I want to pray with you that you have a change of heart and a change of mind to repent for what you're doing. And guess what? If a person is really spiritual, they're going to hear the voice speaking through you, the voice of God. And they're going to accept it. They're going to receive it. And they're going to repent from it. But by coming to you, tearing you down, beating you, and slandering you, and make you feel like you're no good and never going to mount to God's grace, no measure up to God's standards, then you leave the church broken and wounded and destitute. Because I've been hurt, I've been beaten, I've been wounded, I've been scarred in the church, so I feel like I don't need to go to church no more because I've been church hurt. And I've been in places like that. I heard people tell me about this that went through these different types of behaviors. And they, they came to me and I prayed with them. They don't have a repentable heart to give their life to the Lord. Allow God to cleanse their minds from the church hurt to heal them and deliver them. Then you need to go back to the shepherd of the house to let them know what's going on. The reason why you left the church, do it in a decent and in order. And guess what? Many times they end up going back and end up staying in that church because they knew God sent them there. But the enemy knows there's something in every house that God has for you to receive, but you can't receive it because your mind is allowing the enemy to filtrate it with garbage. So you find yourself trying to take matters in your own hand. And God is saying, that's not my mind. I've given you. I gave you the mind of Christ. Now walk in it. How can God use corrupt leaders? How can God use corrupt, corrupt leaders? Many people ask, why does God put people under leaders who make serious mistakes, even some that are wicked? Look at the childhood of Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2 through chapter 5. So you read the whole book of Samuel, you get a chance. God, not the devil, was the one who put this young man under the authority of a corrupt priest named Eli. If you read the story, how Eli the priest had two sons who were wicked in the temple. They were having sex with people at the temple entrance. They were robbing people of their sacrifice. They were doing all things that God told them not to do in the temple entrance. And because Eli was the priest, God gave him a word. Say, Eli, you need to tell your children to stop doing what they're doing or you and your son are going to die. So let me read on a little further. So 
his two wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas, Phinehas, who were priests as well. These were men who were very wicked. They took offerings by manipulation and force and committed fornication with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle. Can you imagine if you were serving a minister who lived this kind of life? A minister who was so insensitive to the things of the spirit that he couldn't recognize a woman in prayer and accuse her of being a drunk. So fleshly, they was grossly overweight. So compromising that he did nothing about his sons whom he had appointed as leaders who were committing a fornication right in the church. I've known bishops. I've known apostles. I've known pastors who lived this type of behavior in the church. And when it got exposed, they quit the church. Instead of repenting before the congregation, they rather quit the church and steal the money and leave. And this is what Eli was doing. He was not rebuking his sons for their actions in the temple. And God was angry about this. Most Christians today would be offended and search for another church, telling others as they went of this wicked lifestyle of their former pastor and his leaders. In the midst of such corruption, I love the report of what young Samuel did. The new boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. But the corruption took its toll. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. In other words, it had become come down. The revelation was not coming forth as it used to be before this time where they were uh, uh, being perverted in the church. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. God seemed distant to the entire Hebrew community. The lamp of God was about to go out in the temple of the Lord. Yet Samuel, it said, yet, yet did Samuel go look for another place to worship. He did, he did go to the elders to expose the wickedness of Eli and his sons. He did form the committee to put Eli and his sons out of the pastor as pastor or the pastor position. No, he ministered to the Lord. So he didn't do this. He didn't do the things that people would look at as a, as a prophet to expose other people. But he did what God told him to do, worship for the Lord, continue to serve the Lord. God had placed Samuel there, and he would not be responsible for the behavior of Eli and his sons. He was put under them, not to judge them, but to serve them. Ain't that something? How many times we've been in positions in the church where we know shepherds were not living right before the Lord, but instead of us serving them, we gossiped. We became tail bearers. So we carried all the news about their hangers and mistakes and their mess ups. Instead of praying for them, continue our devotion to the Lord, we began to spread poison in the congregation. So the our congregation begins to become whispers. So everyone whispering about, did you hear about the pastor? Did you hear about his wife? Did you hear about so-and-so in the church? How they were caught in adultery or they were caught stealing money? How they, they was uh, ripping their jobs off? All this stuff. We were to talk about all the mess ups. But instead of having our minds focused, we talk about focus. Discipline focus. Discipline focus is when you get to the place in yourself where you turn your attention only to be devoted to the Lord and not what people are doing. And the Holy Spirit inside of you, it compels you to pray for one another and not accuse and spread poison about one another, but to lift them up higher than yourself. Children do not correct fathers but it's the duty of the fathers to train and correct the children so it's not your responsibility to correct your leader it's not your responsibility to correct your brother or sister in the body of Christ but to pray for them and say if your brother be overtaken a fault you go to him and restore him in spirit of meekness lest ye also be tempted why because if I see a brother stumbling along the pathway 
as a child of God who devoted to servitude to the Lord, it's my responsibility to go to the individual, say, hey, my brother, my sister, let me pray for you because God says you're going through something in this time. I don't need to know what it is, but I need you to pray for you to restore them back into sonship. Pastor talked about the prodigal son on Sunday. It was so powerful how the father was sitting, looking and waiting on the son to return, who was a prodigal who went away into the wild country to live his own life. And the father was waiting and looking for a son to return, but he did not talk about the mess up and the hang ups and the mistakes his son done, but he restored him in the spirit of meekness. My God, my God. We are to deal with and confront those whom God has given us to train. This, this is our responsibility. Those on our own level, we are to encourage and exhort as our brothers and sisters. But in this chapter, as with the last, I am dealing with our responsibility to those in authority over us. So a person that's in authority over you, it's your responsibility to pray for them. Not to confront them unless you're driven and led by the Holy Spirit to speak a word to them to help bring them back on track. If God doesn't tell you anything, you need to keep your mouth shut and just pray for them until God releases you to say something. There's many times God will bring prophetic word, prophetic word to the house. And if I don't say what God tells me to say, I feel bad in my spirit because I feel I let God down. But when I feel, feel the unction of the Holy Spirit moving me and compelling me to speak a prophetic word to bring order to the house of God, I do it because God has told me to do it. And guess what? God blessed me in return. Samuel served God's appointed minister to the best he could without the pressure to judge him or correct him. You need to write that down. You need to take note of that. Samuel served the Lord God, anointed, appointed minister, the best he could, without the pressure to judge him or correct him. The only time Samuel spoke a word of correction was when Eli came to Samuel and asked him what prophecy God has given him the night before. Samuel got a word from God. You read the story. And God told him that Eli needs to correct his house or him and his son going to die. Samuel did not say a word. He kept it to himself, but kept on serving the Lord until Eli came to him, inquisitive to want to know what God spoke to the young man. But even then, it was not a word of correction from Samuel, but from God. If more people will get hold of this truth, our churches will be different. Samuel did not bring a prophetic word to correct him or to hurt him, but he gave a word from the Lord to bring conviction to Eli's heart to do what's right. Hallelujah. We're going to stop right here tonight. But I want to encourage you. If you're in a position where you know that there are leaders in your church or people in your church who you know is not following the order of God and not walking in their devotion and allegiance to God, pray for them. Don't say a word to them that comes from your flesh or your feelings until God speaks a prophetic word to you to speak a word to the individuals. Don't you say a word, but encourage them. Because the Lord is going to hold you accountable for the words that come out of your mouth. Every idle word, he said, we will give an account for. So whatever word I speak, if it's not of God, and I try to say something, God did not tell me to do, guess what? I'm lying on God. You got a lot of people prophesying in the house of God. They prophesy. I didn't say prophesy, prophesy. They tell a lie what God spoke. And it's not from the word because they don't line up with the word. I'm going to tell you this nugget. Any prophetic word that God speaks to you or any individual is something you already know about. 
God is confirming through the prophet something he spoke to you before that it's going to come into fruition in your life. And it's up to you to accept the Holy Spirit to begin to speak to you by the Spirit a word that confirms what God calls you to do in the body of Christ. So if I find someone that's not living right in the body of Christ, I can go to them, like I mentioned earlier, I can pray with them and pray for them that God will speak to their hearts and bring them back to the right track, that straight and narrow way that leads to life and peace. But if you know someone who's not living right for the Lord and you hang around them and you don't speak anything to help get them back, back on the right track, you're going to be held accountable. There are people that have been in my arena who God told me to speak a word in the proper time, in the proper season. And that word helped turn their life around. Why? Because I obeyed the voice of the Holy Spirit. But I didn't go according to my own accord. I didn't go because I felt like I needed to say a word. I waited and I waited, sometimes even waited for months for God to give me a word to speak to certain individuals. And when I spoke that word, it was an on-time word from the Spirit of the living God. And that word changed their destiny, changed their life, even saved some people's lives. So I want to encourage you tonight. Get into a place of prayer. Get into a place of consecration. Don't allow yourself to be a tailbearer. Don't allow yourself to be a vagabond. A spiritual vagabond. We talked about someone who just can't settle. They're insecure. They're wandering. Always looking for faults in other people. Just can't see the fault in their own self. But I want you to get into a place of prayer where you seek the face of God and say, God, what is it? I need to say to help bring you glory. If there's somebody in my life, oh God, that's not living right for you, give me a kind word that comes from the heart of God to speak to them, to encourage them to get back on track. I guarantee God will do that because he loves us, he cares about us, he wants us to do right, he wants to live right, he wants to live in servitude, live in humility, he wants to live upright before him, that his presence will abide and settle and camp out in our hearts on a daily basis. So, Lord, tonight I thank you for this word. I pray this word I'm not falling from deaf ears, but this word will bring conviction to all of our hearts, oh God. If we're those type of people that your word talk about, spiritual vagabonds, wanderers, wayward, stubborn, prideful, rebellious, Always gossiping, backbiting on somebody else, God. Stingy and selfish, God. Break that spirit tonight off our minds and our hearts, oh God. We rebuke that unclean spirit in the name of Jesus and command it to lose its hold off our minds and our hearts, oh God, that we have nothing to hinder us from living a fruitful and a free life in the kingdom of God. And I thank you, oh God, in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I thank you all for tuning in. I see my pastor came on too tonight. God bless you. Uh, my cousin Stella, God bless you. I also want to send condolences tonight to my uh, my cousin Jabbar and the Emory family. On this side of the family, they had a relative die. We just want to continue to lift them up in prayer to the Emory family that God would bring peace and comfort to their hearts to get them through this time of sorrow and grief. Because we never know when your life is going to be taken from you. I saw an old friend on him named Randy. God bless you, my brother, for tuning in tonight. But I pray that you all stay encouraged, stay excited about Jesus, stay in the Word. And I want you to pray this simple prayer with me tonight. You might be someone who might be a backbiter. You might be somebody I talked about tonight in our lesson. But I want you to pray this simple prayer. It's going to cover all of us, that we will have nothing to hinder us from walking as a newborn creature in Christ Jesus, a child of God. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. I ask that you come into my heart, forgive me for my sins, knowing and unknowingly. Cleanse my mind, cleanse my heart, and come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that you forgive me for all my sins and set me free from unrighteousness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You prayed that prayer, you've been restored, you've been born again. For the first time, you never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. God loves you. The angels of heaven are rejoicing over one sinner who gave their life to Christ tonight. 
So you stay encouraged and know that God loves you. Find yourself a Bible-based church, Bible-based believing church, put it that way, and get connected to a local church. It's very important because you got to be able to have fellowship to grow in your relationship with Christ among other believers because among the believers, there's power and strength. God don't have the long ranges in his kingdom, but encourage you to get connected and stay connected in the body of Christ. And I tell you, when you do, you will be strengthened. You'll be empowered. You'll find yourself every day growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I got the link on tonight. You want to sow a seed into the ministry? Feel free to do so. The link is on here. Every seed we sow, it goes back into the ministry. And I pray God continue to bless all of you for tuning in tonight. It's a lot of people on tonight. God bless you. Thank you, uh, uh, Pastor Denise and Deborah. God bless you. Amen. God bless you all for joining in. My cousin Jabbar, God bless you. But John, my friend Wester, God bless you all. Stella, God bless you, cuz. Amen. 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 Tony, God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. My cousin Jackie, God bless you for tuning in tonight. Gail, God bless you. Amen. Uh, Shamit, God bless you again for tuning in tonight. But you all stay encouraged. Share this video with somebody else that you feel may need to hear this word to help change their life, to change their mind, change their attitude. And I tell you, when you share this word, the word becomes enriching, not just for yourself, but in the lives of other people. And I thank God for the people who listen to this word every week, who even hears it after the recording tonight. May God continue to bless all of us and continue to empower us keep growing in the, in the strength and the wisdom of God's word and knowledge and understanding to change our lives forever for the better. So Lord God, I thank you tonight, oh God, for this lesson. I pray, oh God, that you continue to strengthen, empower, build us up in our faith to trust you, that we walk by faith and not by sight in the promises of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You all have a blessed night. Any questions or comments, feel free to inbox me at Charles B. Emery. And I, I will answer your question accordingly. Feel free, feel free to inbox me. Inbox me your questions or, uh, if you have any questions or comments. Amen. Until next time, Lord, to the same. We'll resume again next week at the 6 o'clock hour. God bless you all. Have a great and an awesome and a beautiful night in the presence of the Lord.